have uh, expressed interest of, of, of being on the call. Um, now, one of the things that's just there is, is recording the call. Uh, we can record that here and make that available if, if people would like, or if people would prefer not to, um, please just let us know now and, uh, and we won't record it. But there could be information in here that's useful to people as we go, go forward. I'll get some more light. I haven't got any light. Yeah, so, um, yeah, so thanks, everyone. Um, the, when Buddy contacted me the other day about this, um, the question really came up about uh, schooling and education and, and, and the topic of natural law. So um, the, in this current environment that we're in where things have sort of gone fairly crazy, particularly in the last week with supposed uh, vaccine mandates and so on, it's useful to get an idea of what natural law is and the different jurisdictions that are out there. So. Um, so I'm going to start off just quickly talking about that. So if we think at the beginning, a, a basic principle in this is that the creator, and if, we, if we're all comfortable with the idea that there is some, uh, some creative force in the universe, that the creator created men and women. And men and women then got together and, and, and decided they needed protection in certain ways and, and, and services in other ways, men and women created government. And governments then created service corporations, corporations to provide the, the, the services to the men and women. So this is the sort of a, a basic hierarchy. And then what happens is that when we find ourselves in that hierarchy, we have a choice of the jurisdiction that we're under. So for instance, um, many of you here have children. And, uh, you know, I've got children. And when my children were growing up, they were in my jurisdiction as their father and, and along with their mother. And, uh, and so, you know, we have a dominion over the children that we have, our, off, off, our offspring. And, uh, you know, if we're out in the workplace, um, we have an employer, and we have an employment agreement, then we're working in the jurisdiction of that employment agreement. And if we have a dispute with that, we might go to a higher authority, and so it goes. But as we, as we look to a greater context, a larger context, and we find ourselves in difficulties that we have right now, the essential thing is to get a really clear understanding of the jurisdiction that those people in Wellington have and how it is that they seem to have um, captured a jurisdiction over us and over our, uh, over our offspring. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that to start with. And um, so I think, first of all, what I'd like to talk to is that in terms of, of natural law, we're talking customary law. We're talking about the laws of nature. We're talking about what's occurring with the bees, with the, the trees and ourselves, because we are nature. We come from the earth, we return to the earth. We breathe the air, we have a backbone. We're attached to the ground. And, and the process of discovering who we are becomes a very spiritual process. And, and so in the context of our talk here now, what I'd like to sort of hold above everything is the spiritual relationship that we have with everything that's out there. And, and holding that as our guiding principles. So with that come our beliefs and our values. So what is important? What is important to you and to me? And what do we agree upon as the foundations when we make law, L-O-R-E, as much as L-A-W, or more important, in fact. So we start talking about natural law, and then we bring it into customary law. The customary law, L-O-R-E, the agreements that we have between men and women in community and how we come together. 
So in um, Aotearoa, uh, in this land, we have as the highest measure of that customary law, tikanga. And tikanga can probably be described in, in general as, as the guidelines for daily life and, and the interaction between cu a culture. And uh, I'm going to use the word maori, M-A-U-R-I, as opposed to M-A-O-R-I, and talk about pure spirit. And talk about who we are as pure spirit and our relationship to the elements. And we hold that when we talk about natural law, customary law, tikanga. And, and then with that comes kawa and uh, the, the, the practicalities, the ceremony, the, the protocols that, that go along with this. So, and, and this concept allows us to think very globally around this. Because if we start looking at other languages, we find that there are crossovers. So for instance, if, uh, if we go to Old German, we will find that ma means mother and uri means primordial. So we start talking about the primordial mother, ma uri. And that's, you know, um, old middle European languages that are carrying a very, very similar theme to them that, that we, we might have here within to reo. So, so there's an element here about claiming our nativity, our nativeness. And, and what's really important here, if we're going to start talking about natural law, is that we consider ourselves as native. And here in Aotearoa, um, in the early days, there was actually a piece of uh, legislation that was passed. It was called the um, Native Districts Regulations Act of 1858. And it's quite interesting because in section 11, it says, half castes and other persons of mixed race living as members of any tribe, any native tribe, and all Aboriginal natives of the Pacific Ocean shall for the purposes of this act be deemed as persons of the native race. Now that stands today. So we are all native and we can all claim that nativity, that nativeness within us. We all come from somewhere on this planet. We're all connected to the earth. We have that, we are the earth. Now in the history of this land, it, 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 it was quite interesting because if we go back to the Constitution Act of 1852, um, the, uh, the Constitution Act of 1852 uh, states very clearly that, and I'll read it, uh, this is section 71, it's very important. And whereas it may be expedient that the laws, customs and usages of the Aboriginal or native inhabitants of New Zealand so far as they are not repugnant to the general principles of humanity, should for the present be maintained for the government of themselves. So what we find is we, the native people, collectively, and it doesn't matter where you are from within the Pacific or the Aboriginal people of the Pacific, the Origines, we are all native and we all have the right to self-determination. So I'm just going to repeat that. I'm going to go back. Sarah's asked here, can, can we repeat that? So, so we're talking about the, um, uh, the, the, the native, uh, the, the early legislation from 1858 that makes it very clear who the native people are. And the funny thing was at the time, that was the European settlers would have never identified as native. And the purpose of some of this legislation was to then trap them so that they, they could be administered. Because at the time, the native people were seen to be in their infant state. And, uh, and so there was a number of different pieces of legislation, the Maori uh, Real Estate Act and others that were put in place to administer uh, the native people. And they 
surreptitiously put all the European settlers into the same basket by using these definitions. We're now going to turn that around and use that to claim our own self, uh, our own right to self-determination, our own rights to tino rara tiratang. So, um, so that was uh, section 71 of the 1852 Constitution Act. And I'll just read that again. And whereas it may be expedient that the laws, customs and usages of the Aboriginal or native inhabitants of New Zealand, so far as they are not repugnant to the general principles of humanity, should for the present be maintained for the government of themselves in all their relations to and dealings with each other, and that particular districts should be set apart within which laws, customs or usages should be so observed. And it goes on a little bit, but... but that first part of it is really the important thing there. So that's the uh, 1852 Constitution Act, and it's really, really significant. And I'm going to come to it again in, in a short while. Another thing that's really, really important to consider is that at, uh, if we go back in our history, if we go back to the time of uh, the, the early 1800s, and we look at what was happening, the, uh, the native people, the originally people of the Pacific, started trading. And within uh, Te Eka, a Maui, uh, that's the North Island, uh, and Te Waka, a Maui, the South Island, um, people started trading and uh, they started uh, building ships. And uh, there were not just a little waka going around the coast, there were ocean-going vessels, and, uh, and they were trading but those vessels were being seized because they did not have a flag. This is a very short history, so forgive me if there's errors and omissions in here. They didn't have a flag. And uh, about uh, 1820, Hongi Hika was in England and he met with uh, King George and uh, a conversation started around these problems and eventually um, there was a flag and we know it, uh, many will have, you will know it very well, it's a white flag with a red St. George cross and uh, four stars, four eight pointed stars in the corner, Tikara, and, uh, and, and, and we'll find that emerging in our history between 18, about 1832, 1834, and then 1835 we had uh, the proclamation of sovereignty and uh, and, and so some very, very significant events that were happening there. It's interesting with the uh, with Takara, the, the flag and, and the authority that comes with that flag. That's a four corners of the world flag. It's a land sea flag. It's a trading flag. And uh, it is the only flag of that authority that is not owned by the banks. Interestingly enough, in our, in our current situation, um, William the Fourth. Interestingly, William the Fourth was King of England. He was also King of Hanover, and uh, so this, the background to this is absolutely enormous. Um, the main, the biggest authority that was used behind that flag was the Henry the Eighth Herbalist Charter. Now Henry the Eighth did not believe in doctors. He was not happy with doctors, and he was a herbalist. And uh, he wanted to enable herbalists to be able to travel the world and to be able to trade freely. And so we have that flag and the authority behind it. Now, William IV's parliament was the House of Lords and his court, the, the main court that he was working through is the Privy Council. And the House of Lords has a set of books where most of the documentation is recorded. It's called Halsbury's Law. And uh, what's significant with Halsbury's Law, and I'm just going to read out a passage. And this is from the third edition, volume 36 of Statutes. Um, it's a bit much here to remember, but I'm giving it to you anyway. Paragraph 559 at page 337. It says, section 12.1, New Zealand Parliament cannot derogate from the sovereign supremacy of England. So New Zealand Parliament can, cannot take away from the sovereign supremacy of England. And England cannot derogate from the sovereign supremacy 
of the Maori nation assembled in parliament at Waitangi. So for the record, we know where the highest court on this land is located. It's located in Waitangi. And on the 28th of October every year, a Whakaputanga is celebrated. The proclamation of sovereignty is, is celebrated. And interestingly, that uh, on the uh, 6th of February every year at Waitangi, uh, the Navy are obliged, they're obligated. They fire a 21-gun salute to, to Kara, the flag, the flag that was um, brought here as a gift and as an acknowledgement of, of the sovereignty from William IV. So we know that that's a very, very important foundation document and flag. It is the only lawful flag of this land. So I'm, I'm giving you that background information and, and, and it's, it's very significant because um, when we, bring it down and we start to have, have a look through our history. And again, I'm going to skim very, very fast. The first parliament, the parliament was established from New South Wales. And at that time, in the early days, New Zealand encompassed part of the Gondwana continent and, uh, and, and, and really started from New South Wales. And what we ended up was the settlers parliament of New South Wales residing in Wellington. So, so the parliament in Wellington is really for the settlers and not for the native people. So we have a choice. Are we a native or are we a settler? If we're a settler, we fall under the jurisdiction of the settlers parliament. If we're not, then we can stand autonomously as men and women who are self-governing as of right that was given to us and acknowledged from the early days, acknowledged through Hei Whakaputanga, acknowledged in the 1852 Constitution Act, and still valid today. Now, there's a piece in here that's, um, that not many people know about. And that was an event that happened in, uh, in 1986. Now, as we come to that, the, there is a corporation that is currently operating on the shores. The corporation is called Her Majesty the Queen and Right of New Zealand. And this corporation is registered on, with the Securities Exchange Commission, which is the, uh, the American Companies Office. And that is the body, the vehicle that Wellington are trading through. Now, a little time out in my, my, my story here. We're very familiar with the United Nations and we're very familiar how, with how organizations such as the World Health Organization have contributed to the current situation. What's interesting is that, uh, yeah, thanks, Stephanie, for putting that, uh, that up there in the comments, you'll find uh, the reference to the corporation. Now, all member states of the United Nations are corporations. They're all corporations. We could describe them as trade zones, but they're definitely not de jure governments. They're acting as governments and they're taking authority as governments. And as you will have heard Jacinda and many of the others say, they govern by consent. They do not have any lawful right. They can only govern if we allow them to do so. And we only consent to that governance when it suits the living men and women. Come back to what I said before. The creator created men and women and men and women created governments and governments then created corporations as service corporations. How did we end up down the bottom of the pile thinking that we are subservient to a service corporation? It's a very good question. Now, um, uh, when we rise back up here, we know this corporation exists. And when we go back to 1986, we had effectively a coup that happened on these lands. 
1986, the, the Palmer government of the day attempted to repeal the 1852 Constitution Act. They wanted to repeal section 71 that I talked about earlier on in this call. They did not want the idea that there's a self-governing people on this land. The trouble is, it was the 1852 Constitution Act that gave them the right to be a government in the first place, and all they did was effectively cut off their own heads. Oh, he put, uh, he was a royal regent. He is from up in the north. He uh, studied law in England, uh, and he uh, uh, was in the House of Lords. He, uh, with the assistance of the Navy, put the Executive Council under house arrest. And um, uh, then there was uh, a couple of pieces of legislation brought into the corporation government to try and restore what they had taken away before. So uh, we ended up with the Imperial Laws Applications Act and in 1993 to Turi Whenua, which again restored the right to self-governance, but not as it should have been. So since then, the corporation has kept going and we've ended up in the situation that we have. John Key had a flag referendum to try and legitimize their governance. Uh, we the people turned it down and uh, here we are. So lots of comments coming in in, in here uh, to, to back that up. So thanks, Stephanie. So what we've got now is a corporation who have docked their corporate piece of paper on our shores. And we, the living men and women who claim our native status, are not bound by that. Because if I go back to Hallsbury, remember Hallsbury's law from uh, House of Lords? It says very, very clearly. I'm going to read this again. New Zealand Parliament cannot derogate from the sovereign supremacy of England, and England cannot derogate from the sovereign supremacy of the Māori nation assembled in Parliament at Waitangi. And following the principle found in K, and I'm not going to go back up there, a statute does not need to state that it cannot be repealed because once put in force, it cannot be repealed by any later Parliament. Its provisions can merely be brought forward into current legislation because a later parliament cannot derogate from its forefathers' legislation. So we know that the 1852 Constitution Act stands. It is the only Constitution Act. And, uh, you know, back in December last year, um, circumstances had it that my partner and I were, were traveling down to Wellington to try and help someone through the borders. Uh, flying from Australia back into New Zealand, into Aotearoa, and uh, uh, she was stopped. She was flying interstate, because if you happen to go and look up the Australian, uh, the Commonwealth of Australia Constitution Act, you'll find that New Zealand is in fact a state of Australia still. You also find that in, in the uh, English legislation, the imperial legislation. So she was flying interstate and they blocked her. Um, a conversation occurred between uh, myself and uh, Gregory Bowen, who's the secretary to the governor general. He's the consular general. He's also a royal regent representing the queen here. And he told us that the queen, uh, the crown of England have not been here for a generation. And, uh, and so, you know, without going into a whole lot of extra, um, what we've got is a, uh, a corporation in Wellington, and as Sarah is saying in the comments here, Jacinda is breaking our own law. She has no status. She's uh, an interloper. And, uh, and so the thing comes down to how we stand. So I'm going to come right back. We've got natural law as the highest. That's, and in terms of the law that's written down, I'm going to start addressing common law and a few other aspects of this, just to give you some context. William IV put his hand, when, when he was uh, crowned, he put his hand on the King James Version of the Bible and swore to uphold the law and be defender of the faith. The only law that he was talking about is what was written in the Bible, the King James Version of the Bible, and that stands today. When Queen Victoria, who succeeded him, put her hand on the Bible, she did the same. 
down through Queen Elizabeth, who did the same. So there is nothing in any of the legislation that Wellington have that talks about a man or a woman. It only ever talks about a person. A person shall do this. A person shall do that. What's a person? A person is a job description in the corporation. It's the legal embodiment. And I'm going to come back to that in a moment. But what I do want to talk about, knowing that uh, the corporation in Wellington is merely that and not a de jure government, is that first they're registered in the United States of America. And uh, when we go through the uh, legislation and we find where the jurisdiction really resides, it's in the Ross Dependency. It's not on these lands. The Ross Dependency had no one living there, so they were able to put their flag in the ground and stake a claim. And uh, so on uh, Te Eka Maui, uh, Te Waka Maui, um, they have no jurisdiction. The Ross dependency, and if we look at that word dependency, it means it's dependent. It's actually the United States of America that has the, the jurisdiction over the whole of the Antarctic region. So they're not only registered in the United States of America, they have their jurisdiction based in as subordinate to the United States of America. And there's a very important court case in uh, through the US Supreme Court, it's known as the Clearfield Doctrine. And this proves that when governments descend to the corporate level, they cease to be governmental entities. And uh, um, so when they get involved in taxation or when they get involved in anything like that, they, they're just seen as corporations. And if I read from the Clearfield doc Doctrine, it says, Governments lose their immunity and descend to the level of private corporations when involved in any commercial activity, enforcing negotiable instruments as in fines, penalties, assessments, bails, taxes. The remedy lies in the hand of the state and its municipalities to seek remedy. So what we've got is we've got a corporation masquerading as a government. And that's Jacinda. Good question. And uh, so, the C so the question is, is Jacinda the CEO, the Chief Executive Officer of New Zealand? Effectively, effectively. But we go behind that and we go to the, um, uh, the key officers of the Attorney, uh, the attorney General, the um, uh, Solicitor General, and uh, the Governor General. And between them, they really hold the, the strings and the Chief Justice. The Chief Justice is um, effectively the, the pivotal person in that. So it's, um, uh, you know, it's a long story and it's very, very hard to sort of negotiate that and find your way through that. Um, but the key thing that we need to be looking at now is knowing all of that, we can, where do we stand? Now, when we stand with our birth certificate, we're standing in the public. And when we stand as the living man or woman, we're in the private. There used to be a subject taught in schools called civics. And, uh, and this was a study of our, of our rights. And this would have taught us this. This would have taught us the difference between natural law, common law, etc. So I'm going to go back and just add a bit there. What we've just been saying is that the law that's written down is what is in the King James Version of the Bible that permeates right through the British Commonwealth. And because Britain ruled the waves, um, even the basis of admiralty law comes from that. And when we talk about common law, we're talking about the common man, the common woman, and the agreements that we have between us. And when we look at that, it gets really, really simple. We would find it in biblical references as, as the Ten Commandments, but we can probably look back behind that and uh, thou shalt not kill. We don't do any harm to anyone else and we don't have deceit or fraud in our business dealings. It's pretty simple. Do no harm. Do no harm. That's the basis of it. 
and, and, and then we come forward from there. Everything that happens through Wellington is on the basis of commercial law, admiralty law. It's under an admiralty law jurisdiction. And this first started on these lands in 1817. There was an act of parliament in England called the Murderers Abroad Act. So if you were a, and we know the stories of Russell and the Bay of Islands being the sort of hell hole of the South Pacific and, and all those stories. What would happen in the whaling ships and so on is that someone might have a grudge against someone else. If a murder was committed aboard the ship, the captain of the ship had full jurisdiction and he could punish um, whoever was responsible for the crime. But as soon as they set foot on land, they were outside the captain's jurisdiction. So when they stepped on land, the captain of the ship couldn't do anything. Hence, the number of murders that were happening on the shores in Russell. So what they did through England is that they enacted a law, a uh, legislation called the Murderers Abroad Act, where they brought admiralty law onto the land. And a captain of the ship could try one of their crew member as if the crime had happened aboard the ship. And from there, everything started to permeate from the waters onto the seas. So, as I said before, this corporation, Her Majesty the Queen and Right of New Zealand, has docked its corporate piece of paper on our lands and, uh, and is inching its way up the waterways wherever it can. And if we have a look at some of the uh, Masonic obelisks, we'll notice that uh, 24 inches above the ground, you'll often find a watermark, just to say that we're in admiralty law jurisdiction. So when we talk about common law or natural law, when we, when we it's, it's basically everything else other than the corporate uh, commercial law under which Wellington is operating. So as living men or women, we have to take ourselves out of that and stand in our own authority. We have that authority. It's there. In the public, we have um, uh, government. It's, our identity is created by the state. I've got a copy here of uh, my birth certificate. And uh, I'm just going to show you. This is a printout. I don't know whether I can get it in focus. But, but basically... Um, it's, it's too small to be able to see, but I didn't have a family name or a surname. I was, I was named Alistair John, as it is on my, um, on my screen name here. No family name. Uh, if I go forward from that, I, um, there is a, another document that, that shows uh, it's a certified copy of an entry in the Register Book of Births. Again, no surname. I can't get that quite in focus. It doesn't matter, but it has Alistair John. And then I had a birth certificate. And what's interesting here is that I have a family name. It was not given to me by my parents. It was given to me by, my, by the state. There's a maxim in law that says, he who creates owns. So when the Registrar General gave me a surname, signature, sign in commerce, or family name. Look at the entomology of family. It means servant of the house. It's from the Latin familus, which means slave. So you'll notice I do not have my slave name up on the screen. So when we stand with our birth certificate, we're putting ourselves in the jurisdiction of the those who created it. Now, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail because I could talk on this for, for a long time. Uh, we need to stand out of that. And I've got a message here. How can you get a printout? I tried to get one for the kids. Um, look, it's, it, it, you've got to be really, really persistent with uh, births, deaths, and marriages. Uh, internal affairs is where you go. There's, you'll find it on the websites. They'll say that a lot of these documents um, don't exist. Um, the ones that I've shown you, I got back, uh, they stopped printing some of these in 1995. And this is when I first started, you know, that's a long time ago. And, and my journey on, on this uh, endeavor has been for a long time. Um, so I'm fortunate to have those.
you can really press them. And if you want to if you do that search and they say it can't be found, then you could always ask, well, how can you, how can you guarantee that the birth certificate is correct if you don't have the source documents to prove that? You'd have to tie them in knots. So that's a bit of a game you might want to play if you need it. But I'm going to move forward because I know that um, you know, time marches on quickly. So when I'm acting in the public, I'm a member of the public and I'm under Wellington's jurisdiction. And when I'm in the private, I'm standing as the living man or the living woman. And I'm in my own jurisdiction with nothing between myself and my creator. It doesn't matter which um, set of beliefs we hold, those beliefs are ours. And we are the ones who determine the relationship that we have with our own creator, no matter what the faith that we have, no, mod no matter what oath was sworn on what Bible or, or, or document anywhere. So, so just as a little recap, the birth certificate creates your legal embodiment. It's a dead entity. A corporation cannot govern the living. A corporation can only administer the dead. What actually happened is they registered your placenta and the living stands separately. If we go to the Births, Deaths and Marriages Act, and I've got some uh, definitions here from that, I'm going to just give you a little phrase. It's, it's a Latin phrase and it is uh, inclusio unius exclusio alterius. It means the inclusion of one is the exclusion of the other. So if I say one thing is included, it means everything else is excluded. And when we look at this, it tells us that birth includes a stillbirth, but does not include a miscarriage. Interesting. A birth is a stillbirth. If we look at the definition of a child, a child includes a stillborn child. The birth certificate is dead. They have registered the placenta. And if you look at the bottom of your, your birth certificate, you'll find the words, warning, this certificate is not evidence of the identity of the person presenting it. Quite fascinating. I'll say that again. It's not evidence of the person presented it. Then it goes on to say that any person who falsifies any of the particulars of the certificate or who uses it as if it's true will be prosecuted under the Crimes Act. And I'm sure all of us have used this document as evidence of our identity. And when we do so, along with the driver's license, the passport and everything else, we're identifying as the dead legal entity. You'll notice that the Inland Revenue Department always write to you in all capital letters. The only other place you're going to find that is in a graveyard. So, um, you know, it's, uh, uh, it, it's significant. The other thing that I'll just read out, and this is from Births, Deaths and Marriages, and remember that phrase, inclusio unius, exclusio alterius, the inclusion of one is the exclusion of the other. New Zealand includes the Ross Dependency. So there we are. So I think the distinction here is if we are standing with our birth certificate, we are putting ourselves and our families uh, uh, and our offspring into the jurisdiction of those in Wellington. And when we stand as living men and women, we take ourselves out of that jurisdiction. Now, if you are very good at being able to quote the Bible, you can use the biblical references to, um, to help you with this, and many people do. And, and for others, we've got another, there's a couple of other, there's a lot of other methods, but the one that I'm going to talk about tonight is something we call a live life claim or live life claim. And, uh, and this is, this is a remedy to the birth certificate. And basically what it is, is a claim on your nativity. It's a claim on your native status as a living man or woman. And a claim 
for your offspring. Notice I'm not using the word children. I don't want to use the word child because we know, according to those definitions, that a child is a stillborn. It's dead. A very, very specific with language and law. And so, uh, you know, uh, I'd rather talk about my offspring than my children, but I get trapped because this is the common way that we use our language and it doesn't match the legalese. I've got to remember that there are two official languages. One is English and one is Te Reo on this land. It does not include legalese. It is not an official language. So it's a claim. The life life claim is a claim that you are, in fact, a living, breathing man or woman. And it's a, a, a measure of your status in a way as being Mauri, pure spirit. Energy in motion. And if we were to take, as I was saying before, Mauri from the old German meaning primordial mother, you know, it links us to Papa Tuanuku. It grounds us. It brings us to the mother. So I'm going to throw in a couple of pieces of uh, case law just to, um, uh, to back up some of what I'm saying. And again, because the corporation is... Uh, as a US-based corporation. It's funny, you know, to think about it as the Inland Revenue Department being the revenue gathering arm of a foreign registered corporation. It, uh, <laughs> you've got to, start, got to start wondering which path we've been down. And, and what's really important here is that we, it's most important that we take radical self-responsibility for this. We have to take responsibility for not learning this stuff. We have to take responsibility for looking the other way and watching television and, and getting on with stuff in life, accumulating assets, etc., instead of holding these people to account. Gradually, 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 they have put themselves in the position that we have now with our consent and with our blessing. Now that we wake up to this, we have to backpedal and we have to stand in the authority that we have, our God-given rights that we were born with, <clears throat> and take this jurisdiction back. So here's uh, a case, Stock versus Medical Examiners, and I won't go into all the details of the case, but it says here, the state citizen is immune from any and all government attacks and procedure absent contract. So where's the contract? Where's the contract? It's hidden. We don't have it. Every man is independent of all laws except those prescribed by nature. He is not bound by any institution formed by his fellow men without his consent. That's the US Supreme Court. Dred Scott versus Sanford. Um, you know, the case law is there. There's a huge amount that backs up what we're saying. So, you know, there's nothing in the way for us to stand as living men or women. I'll, uh, I'm just going to give you another one. Sims versus Ahern, 1925. The practice of law is an occupation of common right. We all practice law. Now, I have a huge respect for those who are called to the law. But we have to be very, very careful when we stand as living men or women, because when we engage someone to represent us, a, a barrister, a solicitor, a lawyer to represent us, they will represent us as the dead legal embodiment, the dead legal fiction. If we are to stand as living men or women, we have to stand in our own court. We have to speak from it for ourselves, and we speak from our jaw. First is the breath, and then comes the word, and we speak. And what we speak is law. If we're made in the creator's image, what comes out when we're really, really coming from our heart, when we're coming from our soul, is the word of the creator through whatever name that you have that you might associate with that, whatever faith, whatever set of beliefs you hold. So coming back to the case law, because of what appears to be a lawful command 
on the surface, many citizens, because of their respect for what appears to be the law, are cunningly coerced into waiving their rights due to ignorance. Sims versus Ahern, US Supreme Court. Another one, just to finish off, in as much as every government is an artificial person, an abstraction, and a creature of the mind only, a government can interface only with other artificial persons. The imaginary, having neither actuality nor substance, is foreclosed from creating and attaining parity with the tangible. The legal manifest of manifestation of this is that no government, as well as any law agency, aspect, court, etc., can concern itself with anything other than the corporate artificial persons and the contracts between them. It's very, very clear. <clears throat> it's very, very clear. So the basis of what uh, I've been working with is, uh, and, and uh, my partner and many of uh, my uh, friends and colleagues, and many of them are on this call, is that we're working with something called a live life claim. And this is a document, and we do it through uh, a little collective. It's not, a, it's not an organization. It's not a registered body. It has no status other than being a uh, community, really. We call it Purple Thumb Community, and we, uh, we do a, a live life claim. It acknowledges tikanga. It acknowledges uh, the creator as source. It uh, uses a combination of common law, natural law, and admiralty law, because really the only virus that's on this planet right now is called commerce, and it permeates everywhere, and it multiplies like nothing else. And, uh, and that's the virus that we really have to be concerned about. So what we're doing is that we're using all of the aspects of these different jurisdictions to claim who we are as living men and women and put ourselves into the jurisdiction where we belong. First in law is strongest in law. And, uh, and so we have some colleagues on here who might be able to answer some questions, and particularly in the context of uh, bringing your um, offspring, your little ones, out of school or out of any um, bind that they might have had, any joinder with the state, the Live Life Claim has proved to be a, an exceptional tool. Because when we go into... Uh, somewhere like a, a school and we, we go and see the principal and we, we put this down on the table and say, well, look, you don't have a person in here, a little person. You have the living being. And this is how you are now accountable. Then they respond in very, very different ways. Oranga Tamariki respond in different ways. The police respond in different ways. So we're, later on in here, we're going to get to some questions soon. If questions come up, we might ask to call on um, some of those people so that we can uh, draw on their expertise on how this might have, how this might come about. So as I say, we use uh, Purple Thumb Community as uh, the the basis of this, and, and I've been associated with the principles of Purple Thumb Community since about 2012, 13, and um, it's uh, you know. Um, We've, we've got some great people here. So uh, um, from here, I'm really going to sort of finish this introduction and, uh, and open up. And what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to ask Buddy uh, this, and I'll, I'll just talk a little bit about why it's helpful for the kids. You know, the thing is that right now we've got... Um, People in our community who might, um, if we gave the benefit of the doubt, be well-meaning, who, who think that they're acting in the greater good, who might think that your little one could do with a nasal spray vaccine, or think that uh, uh, your little one should be uh, wearing a mask in a classroom, or think that for the greater good, uh, a whole range of different things. When they know they're living with a, dealing with a living being, and when they know that the mother and father of that living being have claimed their status as living men and women in law, then 
they will act differently. What happens with the birth certificate, it, remember it's an admiralty law, law of the sea. It is a vessel. We came via our mother's waters into this world, and so it is seen to be admiralty law. We were birthed like a ship would be birthed. The cargo was manifest. The, the documentation for the cargo was produced. That's the birth certificate. And, and so it's a very, very different jurisdiction and a very, very different status. And so when the state is faced with dealing with living men and women and, and young people, they have to respond differently. And, they, and you're really showing them the real differentiation between the birth certificate and the living being in all aspects. And they have to honor that. As we said from the case law, they only have jurisdiction over the fiction, the legal fiction birth certificate. Okay, so what I'm going to do is, um, you know, uh, if, 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 because we've got a lot of people on the call, if we can uh, uh, put our um, questions in the comments and, and then we can direct it to uh, uh, people that might be able to answer those specifically or to, I can answer a lot of them. And uh, Buddy, if you, if you can have a bit of a look and, and uh, uh, just answer them. Uh, that'll be great. I'm going to introduce um, uh, my dear friend and colleague uh, Dorothy, and uh, and and uh, she'll be able to answer a lot of these because she's worked with this with her own family, her own Fano extensively, and she's been able to remedy a lot of situations where the police have been involved or on the Tamariki have been involved, and and be able to handle some of these too. So she's on the call here. So uh, let's go to some questions. What have we got? We just look through the comments. Do you see anything that's... Do you have a letter template we can give to the schools? Uh, so a question there, do we have a letter template that we can give to the schools? Um, we don't as such. The letter template that we'll, we have is, is the Live Life plan. That's basically it. And uh, what we have is, a, is a, an asservation of fact, which is like an affidavit of truth, uh, but of a higher authority that basically makes the differentiation between the birth certificate and the living. And, uh, and, and, and that document in itself does the job really, really well. It's, it's an easy process to put these together. Um, there's there's, a bit of time, there's a, quite a lot of time and effort, but it's, uh, it's not impossible. And, uh, and, and we can talk that through. Um, and uh, yeah, I hope that helps. Well, I don't have anything specific other than that. This, is, this document has been put together by lots of very brilliant minds over many years and, uh, and works well. Um, Alistair, there's, there's, some, there's uh, some questions here regarding specifically about um, how, how to actually, how do we go about taking our kids out of school so that, um, and perhaps Dorothy may be able to help with some of her experiences uh, if she was willing to, to, to share those. I'm not going, it's just I've got my baby with me. Um, trying not to let her be hit over the call. Can someone take it? Thank you. Thanks for coming on. You're welcome. Um, I actually, I, I'm a deep researcher, so I could see things coming in. People weren't listening. So I, I did all the things that I needed to do last year and the year prior. So I was already, when 5G came out, I was already putting the government departments on notice. And the government departments that I was putting on notice was people like the border control who didn't shut the borders. People like Chris Hopkins who willingly admitted that they might have let it into the borders. You know, I took moments like that to put them on notice and to, to let them know that they had failed duty of care, so I was taking over. 
and that's more or less the mindset that I had. So I could I realized that they weren't doing enough to protect our children, and we in the absolute role needed to take the reins. So I then put the schools on notice. I let the doctors know that I didn't appreciate what was going on. Just every one of the government departments I placed on notice, including the Ministry of Education. So I went up the chain of the school. And by that, I mean, I let the teacher know. I let the principal know. I let the board of trustees know. They then swapped out the whole board of trustees for a commissioner who wouldn't meet with me and didn't want to make his appointments. So I actually went to the school and I put him on notice too. I just asked the kids, who's the board of trustees commissioner? They pointed him out. I went, thank you, served. Yeah, now, once he had been served and I had crossed off all the people on my list, I then, of course, took my kids out of school and I waited to see if the departments would harass me. Um, I also used their departments to my advantage. So because I knew police might attack me and SIPs might come at me and all these other departments, I got me a social worker. I got someone that the, the kids were wrapped up by. You know, they, they've got tamariki oranga, but on the other side, they've got things like natihini services. So I let them know what I was doing, how I was doing it, and that I needed protection and the fact that I'm well equipped to know what I'm doing. All I need you to do is make sure that I'm not being harassed while I'm doing it. So I gave them disclosure as far as I wanted them to know. And that was, um, you're welcome to come to my home and see that the kids are in, you know, and they're, they're okay. They're being looked after. So I had a department that could rebut a department. And that's why I did that because I'm already aware of things that they might do. Um, then I did my Purple Thumb Live Life claim because before then I already held, I I was already out of the system. My Myself was out of the system. I did it a long time ago. I used the affidavit of life process. It's 27 steps. It takes a lot of um, knowledge to do. And it's right now unaffordable to majority of the people. It did cost thousands. Um, so the Purple Thumb community appealed one because I followed her in 2013 and I have kept following her. Her information got better as she evolved and it was right alongside the information I was always learning. Um, so the, the long story short, is when you put them on notice and you do it the right way with three three notices and then on the third notice I always default judgment to myself. Now I, I got to meet um, a lot of these people face to face like the Ministry of Education was mucking me around to allow my kids into alternative um, like homeschooling or uh, the other one was the one where you don't go to school. I've got what it's called just off the top of my head. Um, so they, they do muck you around. They, they try to take as long as possible so that you want to put your kids back into school. So I think it was um, Aotearoa Correspondent School. There are criteria there and all of their tick boxes that you need to fulfill to be able to educate your children. Now, if you can't make a program yourself, then um, they will muck you around to be able to educate your children because you've gone out of their structure. What I did find was they had no power. Now, they all operate by way of consent. So... On day 300, I got SIPs turning up. Now, they only turned up because one of my children wanted to return to school. So I went and put her name down. As soon as I did that, I got SIPs and police at my door. Where's the children? Blah, blah, blah. And I said, oh, okay. 
I know where you're here. And then Sips, Sips asked me, you know, we want to see Sonny, we want to see him now. And they had a forceful approach. I went, okay, um, I just want to ask a question. And I locked the gate on them because I knew, I knew that their jurisdiction is outside my gate. So my question that I asked them is, why are you late? Now you're allowed 197 half days off at school legally. This is day 300. So why are you coming now? And then they had a, a board with paperwork on it. And they said to me that, um, oh, well, they're coming to check because many people have made complaints. And I went, okay, I'd like to see these complaints. <laughs> now, in the end, I, I figured them out. And I went, okay, I get what you're doing. What you're really here for is to gain consent. What you don't have is my consent because I've already withdrawn it. So just like the vaccine, when you withdraw consent, that, that's your right to do. So while they were talking, they, they gave me too much in what they showed me. And I realized, okay, so you're really here on day 300 because you need my consent again. You need me to contract with you again. And I realized I hold the consent. So when I know what to do. So I went inside, I grabbed the birth certificate. I threw it over the fence and I said, I surrender, Sonny, to the court, to the dwell of the court. Now, one of them knew what I was talking about. And she goes, pardon me? And I said, I surrender, Sonny, to the dwell of the court. See, that before us is the dwell of the court. Here, have Sonny. But the real Sonny, the flesh and blood Sonny, doesn't want to speak to you. So you can do what you like with that Sonny, but the real Sonny, flesh and blood Sonny, has asked you to go away. He doesn't require your services. Now, um, one of them turned around and walked away straight away. The other one was confused because she was new. She didn't know what was going on. So that's how I handled it. I handled it with notices. You've got to let them know. There's five ways to give people notice. Actual notice is when you do it. That's the only one you need to know about. Um, as far as People saying, do you do you have a way to let the school know? There's a courtesy notice at the back of your live life claim. You're quite welcome to use that. It works brilliantly. Um, I built a rapport with my school before I did what I was doing so that they knew that I was going to put them on notice, that they knew why I was putting them on notice. And I involved them in the process. So they were quite willing to allow me um, where I was heading, I wanted the Ministry of Education. That's where I was heading the entire time. I knew it had nothing much to do with the school. Do be aware of your school's powers, though. The Board of Trustees got swapped out because the Board of Trustees holds the governance power for the school. The principal is the executive of the Board of Trustees, whether he knows so or not. The liability for the vaccines is actually being shifted down to the parents and the principal. Now the why, reason why I'm telling you this is that's how you handle removing it is you've got to have a call or, or talk with your board of trustees um, in order to action things that you don't like going on in the school affecting more than one person. That's your process to do. Because I was only, if my daughter was affected by the 5G and I was able to prove it. Um, the principal I had was a scientist. I gave him one piece of information that shocked him. And while I was sitting there, he looked it up. And then he said to me, you're right. I can't protect you. So what I have to do is release your child. I went, thank you very much. Yes, you do. He goes, now you'll have to go to the Ministry of Education. When I got to the Ministry of Education, he told me I'm red flagged. So I asked him if we could have an honest conversation. And he goes, well, I can only be as honest as my protocols allow. I went, that's awesome. Because so far we're being very honest with each other. Now, um, he goes, well, I have to let you know that I've got 
all your previous paperwork from the school. I went, that's great. I don't have to retell the story so you know why I removed my children. And he goes, yes. I said, what do you think about it? He goes, I'm not allowed to comment. I went, okay. So I want to get my kids homeschooling and my older children educated and they're going to do correspondence. Then he goes, automatically, the government's not going to pay for that. I went, okay. So why aren't they going to pay for the kids' free education that they're all entitled to? And he goes, I might as well get to the point. You're red flagged. I went, okay, what's red flagged? He goes, it means that every time you go to any government department, they're going to give you a CEO member. I went, that's you, isn't it? He goes, yes. I went, brilliant, great. I'm going to, going to put you on notice then. He goes, I figured you would. I went, awesome. And my notice is to let you know that I am going to educate my children. And he goes, that's fine, but we're not going to pay for it. And I went, <laughs> Um, I don't really care if you pay for it or not. My intention is to homeschool and correspondence or educate my children. So he bailed quite easily. Um, but like I said, filling the tick boxes in has been hard. They made it a little bit easier because if you're a little bit stressed out, my son got stressed out waiting. I got to fill that tick box. Now he's eligible for um, being able to get correspondent schooling. The thing is, he's learned from being home a lot. Um, the internet is his oyster. He can learn whatever he chooses to, wants to, and he doesn't want to go back to school anymore at all. He does want to educate. But he said, now that I don't have to sit in the building for eight hours a day and be told what to think, act, do, and have to put up with children that I don't really or wouldn't normally be around, he goes, it's brilliant, mum. <coughs> so um, that you know, I, I did pull them out with the intention of putting them back in to be educated. So I did pull them all out. I was successful. I did put everybody on notice. And then I let them know that they're all coming back. The, I only had one trouble, and that was with um, my 16-year-old daughter because they said that they didn't have to take her back anymore. So they refused her to come back to school. Now, what I did to combat that was um, I know that my daughter's allowed to be educated, and that was just my only conscious thought. I heard her feelings about wanting to see friends. Um, she wasn't prepared for um, courses and, and she felt terrible about what the principal had just done. So I took that on board and I went, hang on a minute, you have a say. So let's relook at what we've done. Okay, you wanna go to school, they've offered you, and then I, then I clicked, they've offered you a remedy to go to course. So we're gonna say that you're not prepared to go to course because you in your own mindset believes that you're gonna be educating yourself at school for a number of years, undeterminable year. So we turned around, we, we refused their remedy. We told them, thank you for your remedy, but my daughter feels like this. Now, surprisingly, we got a call back from the principal and he, accepted it so he no longer stood on the you can't bring her back to school we're not going to have her there's plenty of courses she can do which was the attitude that he had he then had no right to remedy because she had said she's not she's not prepared to go to course she doesn't think she's ready for course so when you're dealing with these departments have a bit of common sense about you your common sense is going to serve you pretty good along these steps. If it doesn't make good common sense, then chances are it isn't the right thing to do. So a lot of a lot of steps, you've got to have a good common sense about the way that you're moving. So where you can give them notice, do so. And you must by law. You must be prepared to tell people what you are doing before you do it. 
Um, so it's really easy to take them out of school, have a good reason. One of them is under civil rights and political rights, which is a convention under the United Nations, you're already allowed to self-determine. You're already allowed to decide how you're going to live your life, the status you're going to hold, and <coughs> none of this is applicable if you've got a birth set. If you've got a birth set, you are stuck in their society and you are to be governed. So that's how their whole structure works. And that's the structure that we are all presently in without full disclosure. I'm sure Alistair would have taken you down the BDM and the interpretations to show you these things. Did you, Alistair? Yeah, I did. We talked about we talked about the birth certificate. We talked about the person, and uh, awesome. and, the, and the distinction between the living man and uh, the the, uh, the the artificial, uh, the legal embodiment, the person. So, how it looks for my ch children that are at school. The school is fully aware. Don't vaccinate my children. They're not entities. They're living beings on the land. And should you harm any one of my children, the repercussions for you are real. It's not a threat. It will actually happen to them because they're living beings. I've rebutted their presumptions. My daughter knows who she is now. Even at 16 years old, I had a birth to a little bubble at 12. And then when she, I, all I did was teach her the word person. And she said, Mom, how dare you burst my 12-year-old bubble? I went, well, I'd rather you know now than be 50 and still trying to find out, darling. I'd rather I burst your bubble. Um, in the last four years, she has brilliantly educated herself. She can speak very well. And a lot of this is the way that you, that you speak. Um, you've got to know what words to use, what words not to use. Don't be too particular on yourself. I only mean in documents. And when you've got a corporate um, person that you must deal with in a courtroom scenario, otherwise you don't have to be too, too hard on yourself, but you do have to be educating yourself. Now your paperwork from Purple Thumb has already done all of this for you because we knew it takes you down many rabbit holes to many closed doors, missing information, and all the rest of it. A lot of us have spent years looking for these answers. And um, it took many minds to be able to find all of these answers. So um, that's pretty much it from me. My, my daughter doesn't get harassed. She, she doesn't get, um, she doesn't have to do a lot of the things she doesn't want to do. Um, she has free will of choice. She doesn't hand over her QR codes for anything. She will not use QR codes because she knows it's voluntary, anything that you give to it. Um, so she's teaching others at school while she's educating herself and things that I wish she wasn't learning. <laughs> but um, it gives her a social life and it gives her her own free will because it was her choice to go back. And I did not want to send her. I went through two years to get her out or nearly a whole year of study to get her out. Um, templates are easy to make because I've made so many. I make them on the spot now. Um, and for a lot of months, how do you do this? How do you do that? But the easiest way is, please, either if you're not going to do a live life claim, Study the living man process so that you can pull yourself out. The only reason why I appealed to the Purple Thumb community was because I was aware you could be a community of your own. True. Um, and she had already defeated um, the dead entity and she already knew all of the departments that it was connected to. And she, she was able to rebut them quite happily in, in the one document. 
um, thousands compared to $111. Um, that looks brilliant for me because I have eight children and the reality of me having to spend thousands on the affidavit of life process to um, thousands on each one of the kids and they're never getting out is what I saw. I need them out and they're never getting out. So um, Lady Crown's one-step process was brilliant for me to be able to get all my kids out because I just got myself out and other family members, my brother, and it cost us so many thousands. I knew it would be so hard to get all of my children out and I was in desperate mode because I knew what was coming. So um, that's that's been the overwhelming reason why I moved the way I did. She was already finished. I I did want it to start here. I wanted everything to be done here, but with the time frame that we had, um, the able people to do it, it didn't look like it was going to happen here sooner than it did. So the only one that brought it forward so that it would happen faster was Lady Crown that I knew of. So any questions just hold up. Thank you, Dorothy. That's really, really great. And it's um you know the thing is that uh you know, I think many of us find great comfort knowing that other people are walking this walk, have done it before. And we now find ourselves in these really tricky situations where um, it can be a little bit overwhelming. And, uh, you know, so um, I've, I've got enormous um, respect for what Dorothy's doing. And, um, uh, you know, we've got, this is not just with the kids. Um, the, these These principles, uh, that are being used work um, with us as, as adults as well and, and with our employers and how we how we respond to these vaccine mandates that are coming down for teachers and health workers and, and other workers as well. It's, a, it's the same process. You know, really determine who you are as uh, a living man or woman and make your claim. When you're lost at sea under Admiralty law and, and, and the corporation's jurisdiction that they have over the birth certificate, you cannot make a claim. You cannot make a claim when you're lost at sea. You've got to get yourself on the land as a living man or woman and work from there. So, um, yeah, any questions that come up, very, very welcome. There are some already. So there's some down here. Is this the only legitimate way to get an exemption from the vaccine? Um, we can talk to that. <laughs> There's a lot of different ways. There's more than one way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, and then there was one question that I saw earlier about um, philosophical or spiritual reasons. Um, the thing is that we find the references from our belief systems that we can carry. So... Um, you know, uh, I know, I know there's uh, people on the call here from the Hare Krishna faith. Then there'll be there are references from within your own teachings that you can you can carry. There are references between in the biblical scriptures, and you can cross over because those are well recognised. The courts are supposed to have a copy of the King James Version of the Bible in the courts, but it's only going to be there if you carry it in, and you have to carry it in and walk with that. And we can. Um, pass on to you documentation that will show um, uh, a vaccine. Um, you know, what we use is a, a phrase called conditional acceptance. And go to look at the, the definition of mandate. What is mandatory? And uh, uh, a mandate is an offer, an offer to contract. And uh, it becomes mandatory once you've accepted. And the key word, in, and if you look up Black's Law Dictionary, is that it's a gratuitous. So, you know, it's a gr gr gratuitous offer. And if you accept that offer, then you're going to get vaccinated. 
So what we talk about is conditional acceptance, not to get into conflict with people, but to um, simply write to them and say, thank you for your offer. And I'm willing to consider your offer. Um, I might prefer to wait until 2023 till the trials are over. But if you want me to consider your offer, you know, I want some evidence. I want some evidence that there's not um, male fetal tissue uh, within um, any of the processes involved in making the vaccine. I want to know A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, the whole alphabet's worth of, of different reasons, and you can put that forth. And if you were to do that, there's, a, there's a, something that's important to know is that an affidavit stands as truth in law, and uh, unless it's rebutted. So if you set out a number of points and you do this in, in the form of, and I would call it a living testimony in the form of an affidavit, um, then it's the living man or woman making this statement as true, uh, then they have to rebut each point. And if they don't, and if they can't, then it stands as a fact. And they cannot put a fact on trial. And you as a living man or woman are a fact. That's why if you look at the screen name that I've got on, on, on the screen, you'll see that I have full colon, Alistair hyphen John is the name. The full colon, think of the grammar. In grammar, a full, everything after a full colon is a fact. So I make it clear, I am a fact whenever it's written down. And uh, so, you know, an, an affidavit stands as uh, truth and law unless rebutted. And if it's not rebutted, it is a fact. So there's a number of different ways to do it. You can do it on, on medical grounds. You can do it on spiritual grounds. You can do it on a whole host of different levels. Entirely up to you. I would uh, suggest a combination um, as fully as you're capable of. And, uh, you know, if you, if one of the things that can make a difference too is uh, if you need to prove that you're a living man or woman, the simplest thing to do is to, to hand write a document. Get off the screen. Do not use black. Black is in the public. Black is, you know, my blood is red. When I, uh, when I die, my blood goes black. It's a sign of the dead. So a deceased estate. So I don't want to be using black signatures and black ink on my documents. So if you're in commerce, use a blue pen. Think of the days when you used to write a check. Um, if, yeah. So we'll just have a look at the questions again. Um, so late to the meeting, uh, New Zealand are living in Australia at the moment, can't get home. Do we need the original birth certificate from births, deaths and marriages? And how do we get that? For the live life claim, we do not need that. We know that there's a problem that they're going to withhold those documents as, as much as they can. There, were, there was a time 10 years ago when they were giving that out freely, but now they, they know that we're onto it. And so they make it difficult. So, so all we really need for a live life claim is um, your birth certificate name, uh, the date that you drew your first breath, not the date of your, not the date of your birth, the dead ink entity, but the day you drew breath, and uh, the names of your mother and father as it appeared on the birth certificate. And uh, remember when I uh, started this call, I, I talked about uh, having children and I named them. They were in my jurisdiction. And I talked about the uh, family name being um, a problem because it's the state that put the family name on the birth certificate. There's a chance here to name yourself. Generally, in everyday language, I'll talk about me. I did this. This is mine. Me, my, I. These are the words I use. But, you know, some of us uh, have a name, a spiritual name that we carry, or uh, a name. If we were to name ourselves, what would that be? Because then we by carrying that name that we've given ourselves, we take ourselves out of anyone else's jurisdiction. We take ourselves out of our parents' jurisdiction 
out of the state's jurisdiction and put ourselves firmly in our own. So you have an option here with a live life claim to name yourself. So something to think about. That is, uh, for me, was a very, very deep, um, deep experience uh, to, to go through that process. There was a lot of grief, giving up the name that I'd carried for many years. I still carry um, that when I need to, when I'm in commerce. Uh, and many people still call me Alistair, Alistair John, but I still carry my, the name that I've given myself and I use that on certain occasions. So that's basically all we need. You go in there and you do that and, and uh, within a few days, you'll get the documentation back. As we say, it's, uh, it's 111 Australian dollars. The administration is over there. Last question. Yeah. Um, let's have a look at the last question here. Um, Nikki's saying, I always referred to my birth name as a slave name. I call myself Nikki, not... Before, the question before. The question before. I was born overseas, South Africa, but I'm a New Zealand citizen. Would I put my claim forward in this country? Yeah, your live life claim is global. This is global. It's, it's very, very important to consider what, you know, the words that I've been using, Ma'uri. Ma'uri means pure spirit, and we're all Ma'uri. We are all living men and women. And uh, I talked about Takara, the flag that came from William IV. Now, um, William IV, as I said, was king of England, he was king of Hanover and had connections to all those royal bloodlines. We are, wherever we come from, we can, if we follow those roots, then we'll find, a, find the point where we are Nati Wirimu Tafa, the people of William IV. And, uh, and so it doesn't matter where in the world that you are. We've got people using this process in Europe, in the Bahamas, um, all around, United States of America, lots of different places. So um, anyone can use it. Yeah. Very welcome. Two questions. Um, what do we present to a truancy officer? That was uh, really uh, linking back. I think uh, Dorothy's answered that pretty well. The truancy officer wanting the, I'm going to use the word now, wanting the child, hand them the birth certificate. That's it. That's all they have jurisdiction over is the piece of paper. That was a question. Um, can your friend talk about using natural law with government agencies? Well, that's what we're really doing. We're taking us back to the living man or woman and the jurisdiction that we hold under natural law. Now, we can interpret that through a lot of different filters. So um, depending on our cultural base, depending on our philosophical base, where are we coming from? How do we see the world? Because there's no one else between us and our creator to determine what our beliefs should or shouldn't be. And that's where natural law sits. I might yeah. add something to that, Alistair, and that is yeah. um, he who creates owns. That's how you're taking yeah. ownership of your name. You're recreating yeah. and, and and then you're, you've got the original paperwork with you. You've got the proof that you hold um, that name and it's 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 recorded with baby crown so that she has the proof that you're a part of that society now the other thing i wanted to point out was um in regards to natural law and and the affidavit um an affidavit gives first-hand knowledge from yourself nobody else can actually rebut your truth so um when you're dealing like with these corporations and that that's that's another way to do it is by way of affidavit because then they have to point for point um rebut your truth now if i got into situations where i thought that it might be um uh the, they might come and get me i made sure i answered everything by way of affidavit and that way i stood there pretty strong knowing that's going to hold me up I don't worry so much now with my paperwork, but before when I was moving on my own, 
I absolutely did worry about all the things that you are worried about now. So I absolutely feel what you, what you might be thinking and what you might be going through. All of these thoughts went through my head. I was just a bit more driven to get to the end of it because I knew um, what I was reading was truth. And it was that truth that kept me going. So if you know you're walking truthfully and you have a good understanding of things, there's no reason why it wouldn't work. You just have to keep at it and do so in honor and, and guide it by others that have already done it or have done areas that you're thinking to do. So, you know, people will reach out and they say, oh, Doc, can you help me with my letter for my school? Yeah, sure I can. Because I, I, I've already done it for so many people now. It's like secondhand nature. And it might seem like a bigger battle than it needs to be. So with the Live Life Climate, it eliminates a lot of those steps I had and a lot of those stresses and worries that I had. Um, and so far, I haven't had any knocks on my door, retaliation or anything. Because I absolutely know I'm in a society of my own that is outside of their society. And it runs alongside it as well. So we're not doing anything wrong. That's what I wanted to add. And he who creates owns is a maxim of law. And it's one of the king's maxims. Thank you, Dorothy. That's fantastic. Thank you. Has anyone got any questions? Just feel free to ask a question if you've got one there. Is anything burning? Oh, kia ora, um, Alistair John. Um, I do have a pathway. If I was to get the live life claim, can you flip back and forth? Or once you've got the live life claim, are you out of the system? So does that mean, you know, it's just I'm, I'm employed by the Ministry of Education. Um, and, they're, and they're trying to vaccinate at the moment, but I've still got a mortgage to pay and, you know, I'm sort of up against a rock. Can I flick back and forth between two systems? Or, I mean, I, mean, I totally get the concept of um, Modi um, yeah. and I think that vaccines are, are going to mess with my um, era tangata. Yeah. So I wanted to see if I could claim. So I've got my own spiritual beliefs that are not mainstream um, religious so I've been passed down That's to me fine. through my whakapapa but I had we had home births so it's something that my whole family does and they tried to prosecute me because I hadn't done a birth certificate um, and it wasn't because I even knew about this it was just I hadn't got around to doing it because we lived on our papa kainga which was far away from the city you know and yep. before you know it a year's passed by so can you flip back and forth or once you uh, you choose your own name and you get the live life love does that mean I need to step out of employment no no certainly right. not and and you know what's really important here sometimes instead of being lost at sea and and being administered by the system you learn how to walk on water so um if you think of uh, law of the sea again because that's what they're operating in when a ship is lost at sea the salvage the, you know um after, after a period of time, people can claim tow and salvage rights. So you're basically claiming the so tow and salvage rights on the wreckage, the birth certificate, the driver's license, the, all of that stuff. Now, you know, I was in a, a situation the other day um, where a car broke down and, and, and uh, I, with an a, I've got an AA membership and an AA plus membership. They would have provided a rental car to help me because I was 100 kilometers away from home. Without a driver's license, I can't get a rental car. So, you know, I know that I'm using these tools, but what's happening is that they now become tools for me to use when and how I need to. But what I'm doing is I'm protecting those. I'm making it clear that I'm the accommodation party to those. I'm not that, but I'm using that. So if the driver's license, for instance, the driver's license belongs to the government. It's given to you in trust. So you know now that it's not you. So you're not going to answer to it as if it is you. The policeman at the side of the road is going to say, um, is your name Alistair John Waite? 
and I'm going to say, do I need to um, tell you that? I'm going to start asking questions. I'm going to find ways around things. And so I'm not going to answer the questions that they would be looking for that would normally create joinder and, uh, and put me in their system. I'll know a little bit more and, uh, and work with that. So you use them when you need to. When you, if you do have to sign your name, then you're putting all rights reserved um, with that signature. Uh, there's a number of things that you learn how to do to make sure that you're protected when you're acting in commerce. So this is what my great-great-grandfather would have known when he was sailing from England out here in the early 1800s. This is what people knew. And what we've got to do now is just teach this back to ourselves and, and, and to our young ones so that we know how to navigate the system and not be taken advantage of as we have been. I hope that helps. Um, do you let departments know that you want to know? Otherwise, you don't have to let them know. Um, I'm answering the question. Yeah. I'm being the accommodation party, so I, I can flip between using the entity or the living woman. And I do it all the time. Yeah. Um, and that's because I'm, I'm gifted with being able to speak at the right time and use it the way I want to. So, um, for instance, I just recently had a baby. I didn't want to comply with any of their rules. I didn't want to wear a mask. I wasn't going to get jabbed. Um, so what I did was, I conditionally accepted that first enrollment that the nurse gives you. And I put on the form that I'm the accommodation party for Dorothy. And she goes, what's this about? And I went, um, it will take too long to explain it to you, but just so that you have clarity, I'm making sure there's a safeguard for myself when I go into the hospital. I'm the accommodation party for myself. And she went, okay. And then she carried on. So she didn't want to know when I blabbled on. And I made sure to blab on so she wouldn't be so interested. Um, and then I started changing the form. I won't be vaccinated. Um, and I, I don't have to wear a mask. And then I handed it back to her. And she goes, oh, do you realize that um, we're under level three and you, you have to wear a mask and you're only allowed one person in. I went, I'm very aware of the level conditions. So um, I did go to hospital. I did have my surgery without a mask on. And I did have one of the ladies in there, one of the nurses tell me that she couldn't breathe. I went, well, take your damn mask off. And she goes, um, she looked at her supervisors to see if she should. I went, look, lady, I don't want you in here working on me if you say that you can't breathe. Either take the mask off or leave the room completely. Your choice. And so she decided, well, um, none of her superiors had said anything. So she left the room and somebody else came in. I went, can you breathe? And she went, yeah, I can breathe. I went, awesome. Let's have the surgery. So, um, I'm always testing things. I used my card to wipe the, the, you know, when you park. I've, I've used the card to take off. Um, they, they've blocked me in. And I've let them know that I'm sovereign. I, 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 don't, I don't fall under your jurisdiction. Uh, remove your clamp. I asked them to bring their supervisor and get a pen and paper. Now, that's, that's a cue to use. Get their superior and tell them to bring a pen and a paper. Now, when you do that, they're already worried because they're wondering what the hell we just stuck clamps on your car. You've ripped our sign off and you've asked for our superior. Now, um, trust me when I say do that because they're already on the back footing. And um, it, it's worked brilliantly. They've um, taken the clamps off. I've given them back their sign. 
um, and I've, I've left them with a warning. Now when I go to the Whanganei Hospital, they will make a car park for me because I just park anywhere. And now they tell me, well, if, if you want a car park, if you let us know that you're coming, we'll be happy to put one aside for you. I went, okay then, uh, I can comply with that. That sounds great. So as you learn and you move, progress, you'll find that you're able to do things that you were, weren't willing to do before. Great, thank you. There's a couple of questions here um, that, uh, can you just show me? I just couldn't find the one you showed me. Yeah. Um, so we can act in our jurisdiction without showing the live life claim to government agencies who knock on the door, e.g. Uh, if they show up at our doorstep. The thing with the live life claim is that um, it helps you to walk. It gives you, uh, there's a lot of um, forgetting your head around the distinction between the legal embodiment and the, and the living man or woman. Now, what we do is that... Um, it's a set of documents, there's 13 pages, and it includes um, the live life claim. It includes a domicile claim that connects you to the whenua. It includes a number of different things to do with its publication and, and all that sort of stuff. Um, there's also a, um, there's a, a, uh, a, a set of documents at the back that can be used uh, we use trespass notices that we put on the property, and um, so we make those available to people, to, just to let them people know to let people know that uh, they, if they're coming onto our fenua that uh, uh, they're trespassing. We have the flag, takara flying on 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 the house, this was question and uh, and and so that really helps. And and so if someone were to come and knock at our door, they're not going to stay for very long, because we know that that they're, they're outside their jurisdiction. And the simple thing to do is just sort of say, thank you, I do not require your services. And if you do that three times, then they're trespassing and, uh, and, and you can hold them liable. So at that point, you can use reasonable force to remove them, you can call the police, you can do whatever to have them go. Does that help answer that question? Yes, but I also very... wonder what if it was the police at the door? <laughs> Same thing. Same thing. The thing is that uh, the police, um, if, you, if you look up NZBN um, New Zealand business numbers, you'll see the police have a business number. They're acting in commerce. So the first question is, um, have I committed a crime? Or are you investigating a crime? No. Then we know they're acting in commerce. So... Um, uh, so you're acting in commerce, I want a copy of the contract. Where's the contract? Have, have you got a wet ink signature on a piece of paper to say I give my consent to anything that you're doing? They've become, they've then stepped out of being a, uh, a, a, uh, someone who is keeping the peace and they've stepped into the role of a mercenary. That's why election is very difficult because mm. you agree with election. Yeah, yeah. Yes. yeah. So does that help, Lana? Yes, that's wonderful. I didn't realise that I didn't have a contract with the police, so that's nice to know now. <laughs> they're acting in commerce. They have a business number. They're registered for GST. And if you look up on um, in their records on Dun and Brad Street, you'll turn, see their turnover in billions. And um, you know they, they're certainly collecting revenue from their work. So they're in commerce. Thank you so much. I have to admit, Lana. I have called them to educate my children and, and not needed them. And then told them to go away with that line that um, Alice's um, mentioned, which is, thank you, I don't require your services. Now, there were two cops. One goes, but you caught us. I went, thank you, I don't require your services. Now, after the third time, they left. So, um, it, it was at that time to teach my children so that they understood in their head that don't be scared of the police. They provide a service. I'm trying to tell you they're the same as the Pizza Hut man. Um, we did it yesterday with counsel for a lady who rang me 
because council had come into her property, had given her the three waters thing, uh, a letter to the occupier and owner. And I said, okay, do you want them there? And she went, no. I went, turn the camera around. I went, thank you, we don't require your services. I went, now, sis, you can tell them two more times and then they must leave by law or you can call the police. So she learned on the spot how to do that. She goes, I don't believe they left, but they left the whole street. And I went, it doesn't matter where they went. It just matters that you didn't want them there. So it's it's in practice, you've got to do these things. The paperwork is, is on one hand, nothing if you don't walk it. Yeah. So you must have the ability and the power within yourself to walk it. If you stick that trespass sign up, you absolutely warn them that you already knew this before you came in. So it's just having the ability to reaffirm that you're walking the right way by pointing out the things that are obvious to people that are going to turn around and act like they didn't see it. Military. I have not had or actually I've had one encounter with military on the road and um, I, I didn't get to action against the military because my son's ex-military and he took that role. So, um, and it was different for him. He just stuck the hat on and started being a part of the service. So um, I wanted to try then, but because it was a road accident, son went, no, mum, this is when I've got to put my hat on and my duty is to aid them. So I'm waiting for this weekend to, to educate myself against the military because I'm well aware they're here. They might even be going door to door. Don't panic if they come door to door. <laughs> It's just another service. Thank them and exercise your informed consent right. If they don't give you all the information and you do not have to make your decision on the day, you're allowed to think about it. Now, do not refuse. Refuse is dishonor. The right wording is you're, you're able to withdraw your consent. And then you're able to thank them for their service and send them along just so you know. Thank you very much. That's great. And the, the real thing is here is that we walk in honour. We walk with the strength of who we are. Now, <clears throat> there was another question here about the Constitution Act 1852 and, uh, and the phrase, uh, so far as they're not repugnant to humanity, the so that so the, the people will govern themselves so, so, so far as... Uh, their own laws are, are, are not repugnant to humanity. And the question is, will they just say that declining all public health measures is repugnant to humanity? Well, um, I don't think that the, the, the thing is that, that they're not in a position to even contest what is repugnant to humanity because <clears throat> they are merely a corporation, a service corporation. You know, um, Dorothy made the reference to Pizza Hut. These people are a service corporation like Pizza Hut, and the only authority that they have to govern is the authority that the people give them. And as men and women, we are the ones who make a decision about these matters, not them. We hold that in ourselves. We walk with truth, we walk with strength, and in honor. We don't get angry with them, we don't fight with them, we just walk. And they're ignorant too. Yeah. And, you know, the thing is that the people that knock on your door, they don't know this stuff. The things that we're talking about here tonight, you know, you're a senior police officer or you're a judge or you're a senior uh, public servant before you learn the stuff. The average constable out on the street or police officer um, if he's giving parking tickets or speeding tickets, has no idea of this stuff. And, uh, you know, so it's it's up to us to act with respect and um, inform them where we where we can and just keep 
walking our truth. So any final questions? I'm noticing it's uh, it's just coming up. We scheduled two hours for this. We've got three minutes to go. And uh, I just thought I'd uh, check in and see if there's anything there. Alistair, um, there's been a lot of requests for the video link. I'm just wondering how we can forward that on to people. A lot of people are wanting to re-look at this and, and uh, go over it again. Right. Well, I'm, I'm seeing that the recording is happening, and I'm not sure whether it's happening from my end or someone else's, but someone has. Oh, OK, we do have it. Yeah, we've got the recording here. So providing it works, I will, um, we, we can send the link back out. Um, the great thing is that uh, the way we set this call up, we do have the email addresses um, and, uh, and we'll find a way. Buddy, is there a, um, is there a uh, group or something you're associated with where it'd be easy to post this and people can come and get it yeah. for themselves? Right. Yeah, there's a few groups that we we connected with this. So, yeah. oh well, then the easiest would be that we put a link um, in those groups. Okay. Yeah. Presupposing it works. Yeah. yeah. If anybody's here that doesn't doesn't get the link, uh, then just contact Alistair, perhaps if your email is there. Is that all right? Yeah, it's in, it's in the chat. So if you save the chat, you'll be able to find it. Um, I know that uh, you also had uh, someone with some common law background who um, you invited onto the call, but uh, this were pretty, oh, he, you know, he had to go earlier, but he, um, he said, yeah, he said there was, he said lots of, lots of very good stuff. So I had a, a text from him and he had to go. Okay. Okay. So, um, you know, just if, if people are doing live life claims, you know, we're really happy to help with that process. We're here. And um, just if you go through the process yourself, just put my name or, or, or Dorothy's name or um, there's a couple of others in here um, if you're talking to them. Um, but, you know, if you put our name on the um, on, on, on that and so how you found out, then uh, it'll just be there. And it's just a way of, uh, from an administration point of view, staying in contact. And if you'd like to uh, contact us more, you can you can do it um, that way as well through that through that website. So it's pretty easy to find. Um, there's loads and loads of videos. Everything that uh, we're talking about is pretty well tested before it's it's put out for people to use. We also um, printing um, a number of different cards, exemption cards, etc. Um, and uh, doing it from this perspective as the living man or woman. Yeah. So I like um, mention, what I'd like. Sorry, yeah. Alice, I just I'd like to mention one other thing that um, uh, Alice has very kindly given us time to, and I think from the comments, everybody has really appreciated the, the knowledge and the experiences that you and Dorothy have shared with us. Um, and I just would like to offer my thanks. And also if anybody would like to give any, any koha for, for the, the time that Alistair has given, um, I know he works very, very hard and he gives a lot of his time to people and helping this way. And uh, he, he survives off Koha. So if anybody is able to do that, um, let, let, I don't know, how did Vanessa know? If, he, if people have Vanessa's contact and uh, we can yeah. get that to him. Yeah. Kia ora. Kia ora. Well, just to um, uh, finish. Up if any final any final questions that are really really burning. Otherwise, I just uh, I did originally thought to start with a karakia and and the way things happened, we sort of moved past that. But uh, just thought I'd share something with you at the end. But um, uh, any any final questions before we close? So I thought I'd just. Um, um, how do we get um, the you know, to join this purple thumb group that you're talking about. Just go uh, in the comments. There's a link, and it's okay. just uh, purplethumbcommunity.com. I, I think I, I make it. We we'll just put it. We're just going to put it back in the link in the in the comments again, and you'll be able to find it. Thank you. There it goes. Purple thumb community. 
www.ecofactor.com. It's uh, just been put in there. So, um, I just, uh, if I find it, I was just thinking of this and uh, thought to sh just to share these thoughts with you. In you is a light. It is so powerful that it can make the seemingly impossible possible. The more you look inside, the more you will discover your unlimited and free being. Take a look inside. So the answers are all within you. And uh, I think many of you are very, very aware of that. And uh, we thank you very, very much for being with us this evening and uh, hope that you found this valuable. Thanks very much. Thanks for having me, Alistair. Appreciate it. Oh, thank you very much, Dorothy. It's a, it's a, just a, a delight to have had you and, and had your wisdom here. Really, really grateful to uh, have your experience as always. Yeah, and many thanks to all our other friends and colleagues on the call and, uh, and people who are on this walk with us. It's uh, it's fantastic. Really feel that support. Yep. Yeah. It's good, you know, you, you don't walk alone and you don't you don't need to feel alone. And if mm. there's anybody that needs to reach out, do so. There's many of us on board that are willing to help and we will spare our time to do so because it's it's necessary. Yeah. So Aroha Mai from me to everybody out there. Kia ora. Thank you. Okay. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Good night.